Good morning. So I just want to begin by thanking Heather Campbell Poyle for putting together this wonderful symposium and for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm very honored uh, to be among today's speakers, so thank you. On a winter evening in 1909, John Sloan stopped for dinner at a Chinese restaurant on 6th Avenue. There, while eating, he observed a, quote, strikingly gotten up girl with dashing red feathers in her hat playing with the restaurant's fat cat, noting in his diary that it would be a good thing to paint. The ensuing work, painted from memory and completed several months later, features the fashionably attired woman at center offering a morsel of food to an eager cat below. At left, a man decorously wearing his hat hunches over his food, vigorously slurping the noodles from his bowl. A pair of well-dressed men at right observe the scene from the adjacent table. The leftmost figure casually holds his cigarette and cheerfully acknowledges the viewer, while the other pauses with his utensil suspended over his dish, directing his gaze toward the left. Despite the noticeable omission of Chinese immigrants, the inclusion of Chinese symbols in the background, and a predominantly red color palette <coughs> suggest the type of cuisine on offer. Chinese restaurant is part of a larger body of imagery produced by Sloan and the other Ashcan artists that document ethnic eating establishments including Mukans, Cafe Francis, Petit Pa, and Renganeshis. The paintings illustrated on the screen are usually associated with new forms of urban leisure and middle-class dining, or to demonstrate similarities between the Ashcan school and French Impressionists. Yet such images are not simply American derivatives of modern French subjects, but a pointed response to the growing presence of immigrants and changing food culture in New York. Indeed, Sloan's painting parallels the development of Chinatown into a tourist attraction, for middle and upper class Americans. And lurid accounts of such racialized excursions featured prominently in turn of the century popular culture. Locating an escalating preoccupation with Chinatown, and particularly Chinese restaurants and urban guidebooks, newspapers, magazines, and films, this paper elucidates how these sites offered multi sensory experiences of racial others. By focusing on the senses and placing Sloan's painting in dialogue with other ways that race was produced in this moment, an understanding of the Chinese restaurant as a key site for the negotiation of issues pertaining to racial difference emerges. When Sloan moved to New York from Philadelphia in 1904, Chinatown had transformed, in the words of one observer, into the mecca for all visiting sightseers. And the chop suey craze, as it was then known, was a particular draw for tourists and native New Yorkers who ventured downtown to sample the food and taste the sights. We know that Sloan visited Chinatown on several occasions. He was especially interested in the streets, shops, and restaurants, describing one eatery as, quote, gorgeous antique wood carving, mother of pearl, gold, and the rough customers. Sloan's excursions into Chinatown can be understood within the context of the late 19th and early 20th century practice of slumming, which emerged as a response to New York's changing racial landscape. Slumming was popular among urbanites seeking out supposedly authentic, cross-cultural, cross-class, and cross-racial encounters. As you can see from this photograph of a sightseeing tour, and a parody of Chinatown sightseers published in the New York Evening World, it was a form of urban entertainment predicated on the spectacle of immigrant neighborhoods and their inhabitants. This practice, and particularly the display of Chinese people and consumption of Chinese commodities, has a long history in the 19th century, ranging from the live performances of the Chinese lady at P.T. Barnum's New York Museum in 1834, to representations of Chinese immigrants on the minstrel and vaudeville stage. But, as historian Chad Heap has argued, turn-of-the-century slumming took on an explicitly transgressive dimension, serving to mark, define, and re-inscribe racial difference in discrete urban spaces. What I wish to emphasize in my talk today is the way in which these excursions catered to an urban audience's desire to see, smell, 
hear, touch, and taste within the city's foreign enclaves. Chinatown offered a rich array of intensely multi-sensory experiences. Visitors typically made stops at the Chinese theater, temple, curio shop, opium den, and chop suey establishment. And contemporary observers repeatedly invoked the neighborhood's novel sensations. Writers remarked on Chinatown's picturesque sights and the oriental splendor of color, the cacophony of sounds and strange utterances of the Chinese language, and the commingled odors of Chinese food, incense, and opium. Chinese restaurants were deemed an integral part of the Chinatown tour as they engaged all of the senses. One observer suggested that the most gorgeously decorated and illuminated buildings in Chinatown were those occupied by restaurants. Others described interior spaces pervaded by oriental richness and replete with silken bamboo decorations, heavily carved ebony tables, and teakwood furnishings. The restaurant served up savory Chinese delicacies accompanied by the clatter of chopsticks and the odor of fuming cigarettes filling the air. This early 20th century emphasis on the Chinese restaurant's multi-sensory environment is particularly useful for understanding Sloan's painting, which captures his enthusiasm for the food as well as the sensory pleasures of the dining experience. As several art historians have shown, the scene is carefully composed. The four protagonists are arranged laterally across the canvas, united by a series of hand gestures, glances, and bodily configurations. Yet several additional visual cues reveal connections between the various individuals. For instance, although the color palette is predominantly red, the color blue pulls a visual thread through the composition. The thickly painted blue bowl at far left is matched by a smaller bowl, perhaps for a condiment, on the same surface. Dabs of blue on the underside of the table lead the viewer's eye first to the morsel of food at center and then to the adjacent table, reverberating in the blue tie worn by the other male figure. This nearly symmetrical arrangement of color not only connects the two protagonists, but it focuses attention on the food itself showing how both figures are either eating or pausing to eat. The figure on the left especially highlights the gustatory pleasures of the scene. He hunches over his bowl, his cheeks full as he vigorously slurps the noodles into his mouth. Sloan vividly evokes the tangibly sensory experience, particularly the sound, smell, touch, and taste of the food. We might imagine the fragrant aroma permeating the air, the noises heard, and tactile sensations experienced as the noodles are savored, swallowed, and digested. Sloan achieves these effects in part through the materiality of paint. The bowl, utensils, and noodles emerge from the canvas in thick impasto, tantalizing our appetites. The noodles in particular are rendered so thickly that he appears to be eating paint. Similarly, the man's face, hands, and lips are rendered in broad, alternating strokes of ruddy browns and reds, suggesting the visceral nature of his endeavor. The restraint of the rightmost figures serves here as a point of contrast. He and his companion are engaged in active looking, yet the man at left appears fully absorbed by his food. In his engrossed state of eating, this individual might be understood as the interpretive key to the painting. This analysis runs counter to prevailing scholarship that focus on the woman. Most studies note her important position at center and identify her as a prostitute who links together the various figures, generating the scene's narrative tension. For instance, Rebecca Zurier has argued that the feather on the woman's hat, heavily impostoed in a brighter red hue, calls attention to her prominent role in the narrative. She is implicated in a web of gazes between her and her potential male customers, which connotes the possibility of sexual desire and exchange. Finally, the curl tip of her finger, which repeats in reverse the curl of the cat's tail, signals her own awareness of being looked at. All of these arguments combine to suggest Zurier's emphasis on the intricate networks of looking so central to Sloan's aesthetic sensibility. But what if we were to interpret these formal elements in another way? 
Notice how the feather punctuates the canvas and arches conspicuously to the left, identifying the woman's male counterpart as a plausible starting point of the narrative. Her upturned pinky finger connects to other diagonal shapes, including the utensils at either end of the composition, the cigarette, the spouts of the teapot and canister, and so on. These gestures and glances unite the figures in a rhythmical loop, but they also call attention to dining accoutrements, food, and eating. With these details in mind, we might see her poised in the center of a web of gustatory appetite. Understanding the relationship between the figures in this way reveals not only the importance of looking, but also the dialectics of looking and tasting at work in Sloan's image, which point to further racial meanings embedded in the scene. For instance, it now becomes more apparent that the two sets of male patrons are likely immigrants, who are differentiated by their body language and manner of eating to indicate their race and class status. A related Chinese restaurant scene by Sloan's friend and fellow Ashcan School artist, Everett Chin, set in Chinatown a decade earlier, provides additional insight into the sensory construction of race at work in such imagery. Created for an unrealized book entitled New York by Night, Shin's pastel resembles contemporary scenes of the interiors of restaurants in Chinatown, including Port Arthur and the Chinese Delmonico's pictured here. The narrative centers on a trio of Chinese customers who are the sole ones eating among other patrons. Shin utilized a fairly restrained palette of brown, white, blue, and black, accentuated by jarring passages of yellow and red. He also employed a combination of media and developed a highly unusual method of drawing with his pastels on wet paper, which, when left to dry, acquired a rough rather than smooth texture. This coarseness and the predominance of black convey the gritty quality often attributed to early Ashcan imagery. Yet they also conform to period descriptions of Chinatown and its restaurants as filthy and odorous places. Sound is also evoked here. The vivid colors, coupled with the dynamic hatching and cross-hatching, convey a pulsating sensation that amplifies the scene's noisy atmosphere. The lanterns in the upper left, which do not hang vertically, but rather push outward into the viewer's space, further articulate the sensation of sound traveling and reverberating within the composition. In addition to these visual and oral metaphors, this group's voracious manner of eating characterizes their sensory and racial access. The Chinese man at right is hunched over the table and his foot braced on the ground, while the noodles are rendered in thick squiggly lines that fall haphazardly from his lips. The intermediary figure's manner of eating is equally exaggerated, while the leftmost figure nearly submerges his head into the bowl itself. These grotesque representations recall period accounts that describe the Chinese literally shoveling the food into the open mouth. Images reinforce these descriptions by depicting the Chinese vigorously eating, particularly in comparison with other Americans, further demonstrating how the consumption of Chinese food could be racially inflected. Shin's pastel also signals a particular revulsion toward the food, and by extension, Chinese immigrants, which is very much in keeping with the era's visual and material culture. In this imagery, racial prejudices against the Chinese were immediately transferred to portrayals featuring their cuisine. For instance, William Rogers' drawing for Harper's Weekly represents the Chinese as a sinister force, cooking while shrouded in smoke and darkness. While Glenn O'Coleman's street scene aligns with perceptions of Chinatown as a dangerous vice district. Notice, too, the conflation of this forbidding atmosphere with Chinese restaurants. A chop suey sign is present, although obscured in the background. The most predominant misconception about Chinese immigrants was that their diet consisted of domesticated animals and vermin. This virulent stereotype circulated widely in the long 19th century. As in this engraving entitled Bowery Pies, published in Harper's Magazine in 1852, the circa 1880 advertisement for arsenic, and finally the 1908 film Deceived Slumming Party, where signs for stewed cat and pug sausages are visible in the restaurant behind the diners. 
Shin's deployment of visual strategies to differentiate the Chinese from the other patrons also reflected trends in popular visual media. While spatially integrated within the composition, the Chinese do not physically interact with any of the customers. They eat at an intricately carved table, delineated in white, which serves to mark their otherness. And while the remaining patrons are caricatured to some extent, the Chinese appear to be indelibly alien. The seated, flanking figures are depicted in profile, which emphasizes the sloping, rounded contours of their skulls and their beady eyes and large ears. By signaling the Chinese immigrants' excessive appetites and by locating racial difference in the body, Xin created an image that elicits an ambivalent combination of fascination and disgust. Meanwhile, Sloan's painting captures the Epicurean appeal of Chinese food, omitting many of these deeply entrenched stereotypes. Certainly, Sloan was aware of and even appropriated these racist tropes, giving them visual expression in a word puzzle published in the Philadelphia Press in the same year that he made the painting. The sixth panel of the puzzle, entitled What Terms Meaning Sad Are Here Pictured, features a corpulent Chinese consul general who's been captured by a policeman. The latter declares, this feller was eating, eating a Sky Terrier stew. The combination of words, dis, consul, ate, or disconsolate, is the answer to the puzzle. Instead, the painting reflects the emergence of new attitudes toward Chinese food, which had begun to shift away from such descriptors as filthy, odd, and mysterious to appetizing and masterful, even as racial stereotypes persisted. This emergent discourse also corresponds with Sloan's own penchant for the cuisine. In his diary and letters, Sloan recorded his avid patronage of a variety of ethnic restaurants, but Chinese food was a particular favorite. He visited Chinatown, but more often frequented the eateries in his own neighborhood in the Tenderloin, where he relished eating chop suey <coughs> and yao mein, hybrid Chinese dishes designed to suit American palates. He usually dined alone and late at night, but he also went out to eat with his wife Dolly, or with the artists Robert Henry, George Lukes, and Ernest Lawson. <coughs> he even ordered takeout. The savory flavor and cheapness of the food seemed to have especially appealed to Sloan. In one letter, he described it as, quote, agreeing with him perfectly. <clears throat> this figure that I suggest serves as the, the painting's focal point could, in fact, be seen as a potential stand-in for Sloan himself. <clears throat> it is significant that, on March 18, 1909, the exact day that Sloan indicated he was painting the Chinese restaurant picture and went back to the restaurant to eat dinner and refresh his memory, Sloan received a dinner invitation to William Glackens' home. He replied, you bet I'll be there, returning the envelope to Glackens with a sketch on the back. Perhaps Sloan had Chinese food in mind when he portrayed his own appetite in this amusing scene. As you can see here, Sloan is seated around the dinner table with the other guests. Though the others eat with composure, Sloan's voracious hunger and outstretched arms pack a humorous punch <laughs> as the incredulous James Moore looks on. Sloan's and Shin's images document the rise of the Chinese restaurant as a quintessential urban subject. Artists ranging from Theodore Wars to Max Weber and Edward Hopper produced images that point to the enduring resonance of such subject matter in the popular imagination. Together, these two works bracket a particular moment in the first decade of the 20th century, when the growing popularity of Chinese food led to the expansion and proliferation of restaurants from beyond the confines of New York's Chinatown. As early as 1901, the New York Tribune reported on the spread of chop suey eateries, particularly along 3rd and 6th Avenues. By 1908, the New York Sun affirmed the trend in an article entitled The Onward March of Chop Suey. This movement uptown is reflected in the chronology and geographical locations of Shins and Sloan scenes. Shins is situated on Pell Street in Chinatown. Sloan's, on the other hand, occurs not in Chinatown, but in the artist's neighborhood of the Tenderloin, bounded by 24th and 42nd Streets between 5th and 8th Avenues in what is now modern-day Chelsea. And while both works focus our attention on eating, 
They represent two very different culinary encounters with diverse sets of clientele. Sloan's painting affirms the delectation of Chinese food, while Shin's rendition capitalizes on sensory exoticism. In each case, the images reveal how Chinese restaurants were among the most contested sites through which discourses of food and race intersected. Attitudes about Chinese cuisine were inextricably bound up with larger assumptions about the Chinese and their racial and cultural inferiority. The recent gustatory turn in American art demonstrates how a broader interdisciplinary engagement with taste can open up new insights into issues of race. Scholars from various disciplines have shown how consuming foreign food could be construed as a racially charged or symbolic act. Chinese restaurants not only provided an exotic atmosphere and close proximity to foreign bodies, but eating the other also entailed taking in and literally embodying another race or culture, often to assert power or privilege over the minority group. In addition, as food studies scholars have argued, culinary enthusiasm for Chinese food did not necessarily correlate with positive attitudes towards the Chinese at a time of intense anti-immigrant sentiment. Thinking about taste and probing the relationship between the senses and racial stereotypes more broadly allows us to productively analyze the racial dynamics of Ashkan imagery. Attending to the historical and geographical context of each Ashkan work also shows how a sense of place and the sensory specificity of place <laughs> profoundly shaped perceptions of Chinese immigrants during the first decades of the 20th century. Thank you so much.